Hello everybody, welcome back. Today we have another Strengths Materials video. Uh, and this one's going to be super important because we're finally talking about the derivation of the flexure formula. And in order to understand the flexure formula, I'm going to talk a little bit about the theory and three points uh, to understanding where the formula comes from. And I'm also going to explain why the formula is important. And before even getting into this understanding, let's talk about the formula and why uh, it's important in the first place and what it does. So the flexor formula, which is going to be these two formulas, which we are going to derive for, is pretty much a relationship. And it's going to be a formula that relates the stress distribution in a member to its internal resulting bending moment. Why is that important? That's important because when we've done our problems previously, we've had uh, a configuration of supports, right? Where you had loads on that member. And then you would solve for the internal shear and the internal moment that's developed along the length of that member, right? If we take that moment, we can then use these formulas to determine what the stresses are that are developing in the member. And as we understand, all of our materials have a point where you can stress them before they turn into a non-elastic material. The plastic zone uh, is what it's normally called. But once you exceed that max stress at that point, you are now working with a material that does not follow the fundamental properties of linear elastic behavior. And we ultimately deem the material as failing once it yields. So the moral of the story is that once we have a moment uh, developed for our member assembly, we can then take that and determine the stresses that are internally developed to see if our member is passing or failing certain criteria. Now, as for the formula, what is important and how can we break it down so that it makes sense, like where it came from in the first place, right? So the first point that we need to understand is that for linearly elastic material, which is something we briefly touched on, the variation in stress and strain is linear. So what this relationship is talking about is the fundamentals of Hooke's law. And when we work with materials, we're generally assuming that the material is homogeneous, meaning that the modulus of elasticity will remain the same throughout the entire section. What that means is that the stress developed is going to be proportional to the strain that is developed as well. So if we know that this variation is linearly increasing to a max point the furthest distance away from the neutral axis, which is a distance C, right? then we can make a relationship on this side that simply states that the stress developed at any point, so if we took out an element of our section, we can say that the stress at this point is going to be equal to the relationship of that distance y to the element over the max distance from the neutral axis to the edge of our member times the max stress that's developing. And all that's doing is simply taking similar triangles to relate the linear, uh, linear proportion uh, of stress increase, right? Now, let's also recall that the neutral axis, uh, for those of us that are forgetting, is simply a transition point between tensile and compressive stresses, right? This is the point where there's going to be no stress developed along that axis. And as you go above it, you have compression. And as you go below it, you have tension in a positive moment case. Now, why am I mentioning positive moment case? That's because this first relationship is actually applying a negative, which is accounting for our sign convention, which is taking compressive as negative and tensile as positive. Why does that make sense? If we plugged in a positive value of Y in this case, we're gonna be entering the compressive zone of this member's section. And since we know that we need compressive as a negative force based on our convention, this sign is going to account for that, okay? We're also gonna notice that this moment is gonna be representing the positive moment convention. And the reason it's doing that is because it's following the basic principles of the right-hand rule, which is not something that I have normally talked about on this channel, but for the sake of uh, continuity for the convention, if you imagine that you grabbed the z-axis with your right hand, and you pointed your thumb in the direction of the positive z direction, the moment is going to be curling in the same direction as your fingers, which is where that convention comes from. 
Now the second condition for the flexure formula is based on another concept that we already understand. And that is for equilibrium, the sum of resulting tensile and compressive forces about the neutral axis must equal zero. So looking at the numerical theory for this and thinking about this simply, we understand that if we wanted this entire section to represent zero, the compressive forces will act one way and the tensile forces will act the other. And if they're of the same magnitude and opposite directions, obviously, they will come out to zero. Therefore, to ensure that this is at zero, we have to set a condition that says at a zero net force, we're going to be taking the, uh, the accumulation or the sum of all the forces that are developed over the entire area of the section. And we already know that force, based on our previous understanding of stress, stress is equal to force over area. So if we solve for force, we bring the A over, we're left with stress times area dA. And we already have a variable which has been solved for for stress. So we can plug that in. And assuming that the max stress will be a constant at a constant distance C, we can bring out this entire uh, this entire representation as a constant, okay? And that leaves us with our second condition. The third condition is using a similar logic as well. We understand that the result in internal moment is going to be the product of tensile or compressive force at the respective distance from the neutral axis. In other words, moment is equal to force times distance, which is the fundamental moment formula. And that's what it's taking at the start right here. So we have over the entire cross-sectional area, we're taking the distance from each element times the force developed in each of those elements. And you similarly proceed with plugging in as we've done previously, force is equal to stress times the area. And we already have representations for this as well. And as you work through to the final point in this moment formula, you realize that you're left with a uh, segment here as y squared dA. And if we think about this in terms of units, we're going to have a measurement to the power of 4. In other words, that means we have the area moment of inertia, or I, which is simply representing the section's resistance to bending, right? So if we plug in I as the variable to represent this, we're left with two final formulas. The first is going to be that the max shear stress it's going to be equal to m times c, which is the distance away from that max stress, over the inertia. And generally, these values are negative, but when you're considering a max value for stress, you generally can consider an absolute value for it. And then similarly, if you wanted to find the stress at any point on the section, you simply have to take the negative moment times the distance away from that point of reference over the inertia. Now that's all explained, let's hop into the problem and see what we're dealing with. All right, so now we can hop into the problem. The problem is as follows. The aluminum machine part is subject to a moment of 75 newton meters. Determine the maximum tensile and compressive bending stresses in the part. Uh, the first thing you're gonna notice is that I've drawn a completely different picture here, just so we can see the front uh, dead on and really see what we need to take out for this problem to make sense. And the first thing that we need to recall uh, for this problem to make sense is our local and global moment of inertia and what uh, they mean with respect to the parallel axis theorem. If you haven't seen my previous video on the parallel axis theorem, you can watch it up top here. But pretty much the basics of the theorem is that whenever you have a composite shape, you're going to have multiple local uh, moment of inertia values for each of the individual separate simple shapes that are comprising the global moment of inertia, which takes the cumulative effect of all of them added together. And that is done using this formula. And the reason we're doing this is because our stress formula is requiring that we have a single inertia value, all right? So the first thing we need to do to use this formula here is determine what this Y bar is. And what Y bar is, is simply going from the global axis to our normal axis, which is that neutral line where you're transitioning from the compression zone to the tensile zone, right? 
So that formula looks something like this. We have y bar, which is going to be equal to the summation of all the individual y values times their area over the summation of area of the entire composite. So first things first, we need to identify what the y values are. So y1 and y2 are going to be for these smaller rectangular sections. And that's going to be this length of 40. And we're taking away this distance, which is to the centroid of the section. So that's pretty much going to be uh, 40 uh, minus 20, right? So if we understand that, we can do 40 minus 20. Or we can do 40 divided by 2, since it's half uh, of the section's length to get to that centroid. Any way you choose to do it is going to be correct to get to that center of the rectangle. And a similar thing for uh, y3, we're going from x, so we need to add 40. And then we have to take the 10 and divide it by 2. And what that's going to leave us with is 40 and simply plus 5. And it's going to be 45 millimeters. Now for the areas, let's solve that in the formula. We have y bar, which is going to be the first y value. So since these two shapes are exactly the same with the same centroid location, we're going to be doing 2 times that distance of y1 and y2. It's going to be 20. And we're multiplying that times the area, which is 40 times 10 for both of those shapes. And moving on, closing that up, you add the third shape at the top, taking that y value that we solved for, which is 45, multiplying it times the area, which is 10 times 80. And once again, all over the top of area, we're going to have 2 times 40 times 10 plus 10 times 80. And simply solving that, you're left with a y bar value of 32.5 millimeters. And that, once again, is our distance from the global x-axis to our neutral axis. Now let's use our parallel axis theorem formula. We're going to start by writing down that it is equal to first the local moment of inertia for these two rectangular shapes. So we're going to do 2, open up that bracket. And we're going to have 1 over 12. And this is the simple formula for a rectangular moment of inertia uh, value. So we have 1 over 12, the base, which is 10, and then the height, which is 40. That's the power of 3. We also have to consider this term here, which is the area. The area is simply going to be 40 times 10, which we had previously, and the distance y. So what this distance y is, is simply taking the distance from the global to the no, uh, neutral axis and subtracting the original distance from the centroid to get this distance here, which is simply the distance from the neutral axis to the local centroidal axis, right? So that value is going to be, what do we have? We have 32.5 for this y value, and we need to subtract the rest of this y1 and y2, which is simply, as we saw for previously, up top is 20, and then we square it. Close that all up, and we do the same for the third shape. We're going to have 1 over 12, the base, which is 80, times the height of 10, power of 3, plus the area, 80 times 10, and a similar thing. Now we have to find what this distance is here. So we're going to be taking y3, since it's the larger value, and subtracting y bar. So we have 45 minus 32.5, squaring that. And we're left with a final inertia value, or moment of inertia value, of 3.633 times 10 to the 5 millimeters to the 4. And now we can finally use this in our formula here for the max value. So the max stress in the compression zone is asking us to use this inertia value. And it's also asking us to use this C. And if you remember what C is, it's the distance from the neutral axis to the furthest compressive or tensile strand. And since it's asking for the max for both, all we need to do here is take this distance for compression, 
and this distance for tension based on the way the moment is being applied to our section. Okay, So let's start plugging in the values. We have the moment, which is going to be 75. This is going to be an absolute value, so I'm not going to be messing with any of the units or anything. Let's just write it normally, 75, and that's going to be to 10 to the 3 to convert that to Newton millimeters, since all of our other numbers have been in millimeters so far. Plugging in the C, we have to take the entire length here, which is 40 plus 10, which is going to give us 50, and subtract the Y bar, which is 32.5. And that's millimeters. And then all of this is going to be over that inertia value. So 3.633 times 10 to the 5. And that is going to give us a max compressive stress of 3.61 MPA. And once again, super similar thing for tension. For tensile stress, it, we're simply taking Y bar since it is that exact distance from the uh, neutral axis to the global X axis or the farthest tensile strand on our member. So plugging in those numbers, we have everything that looks exactly the same, except now we're simply plugging Y bar, which is 32.5. That's over the inertia, 3.633 times 10 to the 5. And that's going to equal 6.71 MPA. And for all of us to remember, MPA is Newton over a millimeter squared. So if you wanted to go through and just double check your units, you're going to have millimeters squared on the top here over millimeters to four. That way, they're going to cancel and leave you with millimeters squared on the bottom. Okay. So those are your two final answers for this problem. And I hope it helped to understand where the flexure formula comes from and how to use it. All right. Thank you for watching.